And now we will move on to the public lecture. And um, our speaker will be introduced by Ana Maria Rey. Okay. Hello. Good evening. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Carl Wyman. Um, we cannot um, deny uh, that we have in front of us of one of the most prominent experimentalists in our field. So it's so great to have him here. He's also a person who had push and promote education in, in, in our field and to the nation. So it's a um, very, very, very uh, great pleasure for me to introduce him. Um, currently, Professor Wyman, he's a, a, a member or is a professor at the University of Stanford. He's board part of the physics department and the graduate school of education. Um, Professor Wyman's career has been amazing. He started his interest in atomic physics. He, he was in her, his undergrad program at MIT, where he learned from Professor Kleppner. And my understanding that thanks to that, he joined the University of Stanford to do his PhD, where he did his career in his PhD in atomic physics. And also, he was very interested in precision measurements. Then, uh, well, after his PhD, he joined the University of Michigan for some time. And then we were very, very grateful to, or, have, or very lucky to have him join the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, where his research, of course, push our field in a direction that uh, is, is very impressive. I mean, because his work was recognized in 2001 by the Nobel Prize uh, because of the production of Bose Einstein condensate. And this award was um, received in collaboration with Eric Cornell, uh, also from Gila, and Professor Kornfram Ketterle at MIT. Um, after uh, his uh, Nobel Prize, um, Professor Wyman got very interested in uh, pushing uh, and promoting a uh, science and education in, in physics and in science. And well, for example, he developed, I don't know if you have played with them, this FET that is our interactive uh, uh, web page where you can play and gain a lot of intuitions about physics concepts. So he, he started with that. And then in 2007, he decided to move to British Columbia. So it was, unfortunately, I joined exactly in 2008. So we did an overlap. And since then, he has done really an amazing career trying to push uh, science and education. I mean, um, he had multiple support in that um, um, and recognitions in that respect. For example, he was uh, recognized by the National Science Foundation's Distinguished Teaching Scholar Award in 2001, the Carnegie Foundation U.S. University Professor um, in 2004, the American Association of Physics Teacher or Ested Medal in 2007, and he also was uh, served as an Associate Director for Science in the White House Office of Science and Technology. So I just wanted to say that his decades of leadership, a tireless, tireless work on education, on science and education to promote STEM uh, in, in, in our nation is, is really remarkable and it's so a, a big pleasure for me to introduce him today for this lecture tonight. So thank you for being here.
Okay, great. So this is going to be a little different from the usual theme op material. I'm going to be talking about teaching students how to think like physicists and equivalently for the younger members of the audience, how to lear best learn to think like skilled physicists. And so I'm going to start with just introducing the educational goals and some basic ideas of how the brain learns com this kind of complex thinking. Then I'm going to give you some research-based principles for teaching these kind of skills and then give you some examples of applying these in both the settings of the physics research lab and in uh, physics courses and some demonstrations of the results. So the educational goal, and I think it's, you know, really the goal of all of most of our physics courses and physics training is to have students learn to think like a good physicist. And, you know, and so, but what does that really mean? Well, what I would claim is that it primarily means that they can solve problems, particularly, you know, novel real world problems like a good physicist does, using the same kind of knowledge and skills that a, a physicist has for, for this kind of problem solving. Now, you know, in an introductory class, you don't expect the students are just starting to develop these basic skills. As a graduate student, you expect a much more sophisticated level, but fundamentally, it's all about learning problem solving at just at different levels. So that takes us to the question of how do we teach problem solving? Well, you know, usually it's done primarily the same way as teaching kids to swim by throwing them in the deep end of the pool. You know, you give, you're given some, the student's given some problem to solve, and well, if they can't do it, then try another one until they keep doing it until they can succeed. But problem solving is a, in physics is a very complicated task and that's just a very inefficient way to actually learn how to do it. And you know sometimes a instructor tries to help out by breaking the problem down into a series of steps to follow or maybe telling them some assumptions and offering hints but as I'm going to Tell later, that's really not very much help in this process. So, what this talks really about how to learn how to do this better, and it's going to give you some basic principles that come out of research on teaching how to teach problem solving. And the first and sort of most fundamental principle here is really rethinking the basic way the brain learns this kind of complex thinking. And the old and still very pervasive model for this is that the students learn by, you know, they, these student brains come into the classroom, certainly at the college level, very different in various ways. We immerse them in knowledge and then the idea is it sinks into different amounts depending on the condition of that brain. Now, and so with that as your model, the focus is, is as most of you know, is selecting the brains that it's gonna soak in the best and then deciding what to put in the knowledge soup, what the curriculum is gonna have that's gonna be most effective. Now, although this is like I say, very pervasive and been around for a long time. It's also just plain wrong. The re research, looking much more deeply at how people think, gives a quite a different model. And what it's, the research says is that these brains come into, the, and at the college level, they're really not very different. But they're also quite changeable. Like the educational process really transforms those brains doesn't actually make them much bigger, but it does rewire the neurons in a very fundamental way. And it's the, the, re, the rewiring takes place as a result of intense thinking that's going on during the educational process. And it's really in these rewired brains, they have 
improve capabilities, and that's really what the learning is, is about. And we can actually now in modern brain imaging see these changes in the brain that take place during the, at the learning process. So what this tells, takes me, the next question here is, so what is the kind of instructional practices that are the most effective at leading to the, the brain transformations that we want here? What's the kind of mental exercise we need to give the brain so that it becomes a good problem solver? Now, you've probably heard of various teaching methods that people advocate, flipped classrooms, active learning, student-centered instructions, various other names here. And, but what I'm gonna argue is those really aren't very effective at using for guidance because they're just, they're, the labels are just too general. But what we really need is something that's really describing the, the cognitive processes that go on in the learner's brain and that, because that's what you have to get right. And so for that, you have to go beyond these labels and I'd argue you need basic principles and principles like we have in science that you know, really predict behavior under a variety of conditions and give you general rules. And so in this talk, what I'm gonna give you is basically principles of, based on research for how to, how to best teach people to become problem solvers. And the, I'll go th in, I'm gonna just give a list of the principles first and then I'll go into much more detail about what they mean. But the, the most basic of these is the idea of, of what's called deliberate practice and then within the context of deliberate practice, decision-based problem solving, student agency, guiding feedback, and problem first learning. And then I'll also introduce the idea of, of social learning as, a, as an valuable principle. Now, these principles, like they really apply as they are general principles, they really apply at all levels of kind of students and education. They, how you implement them at different level, at, in different levels, so it could be, is, is obviously quite different, but the principles themselves, whether you're training graduate students and postdocs in a research setting or students in a physics course, they still apply, and I'll, I'll talk to you about how they apply in these different settings here. So I emphasize the importance of deliberate practice. What is deliberate practice? Well, this is a term and a concept introduced by uh, Anders Ericsson, who studied expertise across many different intellectual and athletic uh, subjects. And he found that there was a fundamental process by which people can, became experts, and, and it was extremely general. And the first idea was that this, this deliberate practice, it wasn't just simple practice of doing the activity over and over again. It was a very intense, focused form of practice that looks at, at the sub-skills of the area of expertise and focuses on, on improving them. And so it's breaking the, the area of expertise down into specific sub-skills and then intently practicing each of these sub-skills to master them individually and then, and then together. And it is, one thing he showed is that it, in the intensity of the effort is very important, and this we can actually trace to, to neuron biology, that you really have to be thinking very hard, to, and the learner needs to be really stretching their capabilities to try to do better, to, to have a, an important effect. And so this just practicing hard, though, isn't enough. They need to have feedback to guide the learner on how they can actually improve the process as they're practicing. And this needs to happen for many hours to, as people get slowly increase their expertise in any field. So I'm just gonna to help 
illustrate this a little better, I'm going to take chess players, which is one area of, that they've studied a lot uh, and what it takes to become an expert chess player. And it turns out they see that ex expert chess players don't just play lots of chess. In fact, they instead they break it down into the different parts of the chess, of chess the openings, the middle game strategies and in game methods. And then they look at in each of these areas, they look at very specific cases and think about, okay, what would be the best move in this situation, trying to pick more and more difficult situations to figure this out. And then they get feedback on their, on what their predicted choices were from coaches or in these days now lots of computers. And so they, they have this, like I say, intense focus, challenge in cases, always seeking to how they can actually improve what they're doing. And they have to do this for thousands of hours and basically be a chess prodigy. People see they just started putting in those thousands of hours at an earlier age than, than other pe people. So that you need something equivalent to that process for learning physics problem solving. But that brings us to the question of what is the problem solving is a very complex process. And so can we break that down into specific sub skills to be mastered? And what I'm going to claim here based on the research of my group is that there are very specific problem solving decisions and that, that make up the sub skills that need to, to master. And this came from our work that we, we studied the how a whole bunch of experts across all different subfields of science and engineering solved authentic problems in their field. And we found that in all cases, their problem solving process could be, was really defined by making a set of decisions uh, that framed uh, th this process. Now, the most surprising part of this was it was a fairly finite number of decisions, 29, but more surprising, they all made this almost exactly the same set of decisions across all these different fields. Now, that would seem awfully surprising, I think, to most people, but and it makes more sense if you actually look at what these decisions are. So for example, when faced with a, first faced with a problem, deciding, you know, what concepts and mental models are relevant to solving that problem. Then looking at what information is needed to solve the problem and therefore what, what's relevant and what's irrelevant in what I have. Deciding what are related problems that I'd seen before that help guide me in thinking about uh, ways to solve this problem. Thinking about what, are, what simplifications and approximations are, are appropriate for solving the problem. And, and then deciding on potential solution methods to, to pursue. And then, and so a bunch of others to keep up 29, ending up with, this, when they have a solution, deciding if that answer is reasonable and how to test that. So, you know, I think anybody would look at this and say, yeah, or any good physicist would look at this and say, yeah, I do all those things when I'm solving a physics problem. And it's just interesting that it turns out to be so general across all technical problem solving. Now, one thing I want to stress is these are all decisions that are made with limited information. By that, I mean that you don't, if you have all the information you need to know exactly what to do next, then, then it's just a procedure, not a decision, and it's a pretty routine aspect of solving problems. That these things are all, you'd never have enough information to be certain, it's, so it's always just making an educated guess. But in the case of more expert problem solvers, it's very highly educated guesses, which are more, the lead to better decisions. So, I'm, because I think these 
problem solving decisions are such an important aspect of mastering problem solving, I'm going to spend some more time going into more detail on them. And first I'll just sort of give you some, some basic uh, categories we've seen, we can sort of lump these into. There's starting out with the importance and fit of the problem, then delineating the goals, there's one decision about that. And then there's a number of decisions, eight involved in framing the problem, and then a bunch in actually planning the solution process, collecting and interpreting information, and then testing and refining candidate solutions. And then so there's a few involved with look, deciding on implications and communications of, the, of a solution. Now, this is sort of makes this out as a time-ordered process, but in point of fact, uh, what we see when we study this is these problem solvers are actually jumping back and forth, the blue arrows here, iterating between different places and going back and forth as they gain new information and gain new insights. Now, the other aspect is that making these decisions involves knowledge, and so we label this kind of as a predictive framework, is how they've organized the knowledge to actually in for the process of making decisions. Now, I'm actually, because I want to emphasize this much, I'm going to give you a minute that just to read through what these 29 decisions are so you can get a little bit of perspective on this. Uh, and so I'll just sit here and wait while you read for a minute. Okay, so you get a, a little better sense of, of what these are, and I'll just quickly mention that the reflection uh, decisions are a little, I look at them as a little bit special. First, they're the hardest to learn because they really require one to examine one's own thinking about how good it is and is it correct. But in some ways, they're also the most important because they're kind of the the error correction decisions in the process. Now, although these are the same 29 decisions across all these different fields, I want to emphasize that making the decision, and actually how one makes a decision, that requires knowledge. It requires specialized disciplinary knowledge and a great important part of the problem solving process is kind of recognizing what what knowledge and what information is is useful and and applicable for actually making those decisions and as i said before we we see that the these experts they have their knowledge organized around making the decisions and so in fact what that tells you in the for the learning process is that the knowledge that you need, the physics that you problem solver wants to get, is best learned in the context of using that knowledge to actually make problem solving decisions. So now I'm going to move on to how to apply these uh, principles in the teaching and training settings. First, I'm going to start with the, the research lab where, you know, you're looking at graduates, students, and postdocs, and then I'm going to talk about the, the, how to apply these in the in the courses, really a, a, applicable to all levels. So, what does what does this mean about uh, optimum training in, in the research lab? Well, in a good advisor in a in a 
re, with a research student actually does a lot of the things of deliberate practice kind of automatically. But what you need to have is the advisor gives the student some challenging problem. And what isn't always done, but I would argue is important is at this level, you really want the students to have explicitly practiced making all 29 of these, of these decisions. And the students goes off and, and so different problems will involve different kinds of decisions. The student goes off and works intently on it and then they report back and they get feedback and, and, on how to improve and a new challenge to work on. And they have the opportunity to, to learn from their errors and repeat what they're doing to get it right. And you need to do this for many hours because it just requires that much mental exercise to change the brain in the way that's necessary. So that shouldn't, you know, I think for a lot of, a lot of good advisors who have thought about this with their students, this shouldn't seem like a very unusual list. Like I say, I think in some sense this is why graduate education generally is so effective, is it really is kind of automatically following many of these principles. Although I would stress that you should, as a graduate advisor, you really should think about all the different decisions and make sure that they get practice at all of them because they're all necessary for being a good physicist. Okay, so let me move on to now thinking about applying these in courses, these same principles to have students learn to think like physicists in a classroom setting. And so first, you, so what is, what's gonna be involved then in this then deliberate practice in problem solving uh, here is you wanna start with an authentic problem and then you have the student then explicitly have to practice making problem solving decisions. Now in courses, you're not gonna have all 29 of them and, and, and you have a very few at any given time, but you need to choose a, rel, a subset that is appropriate for the level of what you're trying to, to the students you're teaching. And you also want to make sure that the problem you're choosing for them to work on in class and homework really requires to, to solve the problem, requires the material that you want to have covered in the course. That's how you decide to the practice problems to give them. Now, I say uh, authentic problems, and I want to stress that because I think one of the places we fail is giving students problems like I show here on the, on the left, which is a kind of very standard physics textbook problem where they've got a massless, frictionless pulley, and you're supposed to find the acceleration of these masses. This is very artificial and and it actually involves students really having to make almost no problem-solving decisions. They're really just largely following a simple procedure. Now, on the, on the right, I show a problem that you could still use in an introductory mechanics course, but it's a much more authentic problem that involves many more decisions. Is you know the problem is you want to get some some materials up to your treehouse in this setup and it's, so how much weight can you pull up, how strong a rope is needed and is it worth getting a pulley? So this, this might be a, a, a much better problem that you would give. Now, I also mentioned student agency and what I mean by this is that the students actually have to practice making the decisions that we did some research where we compared the differences where students were prompted that here's a decision you have to make, but they, they had to actually make the decision and see how it worked versus telling them, okay, here's a decision, here's what the outcome should be of that. And the differences in, in learning and subsequent student capabilities were really profoundly different. And so the, it's important that it's important they're actually make, practicing making the decisions. Now, another aspect that's valuable is what I call problem-first learning. And this, for most people, is quite non-intuitive because I think, 
I think especially once you've ma mastered a subject, you think, well, the obvious way to teach it is I just tell the students all the information they need, and then they go practice doing problems, applying it. And that is exactly what this is not. Uh, and, and instead, it's you have the, the learner struggle with the problem and the decisions first, and then after they've had worked on it, usually unsuccessfully, but can get engaged, then they get the knowledge they need to actually to successfully solve the problem. And like I say, so it seems very non-intuitive, but the results are pretty dramatic as to how much more effective it is in the first way. And I'll say it, in some ways it shouldn't seem that non-intuitive. And if you think about the training in, in the research lab, then that is in fact exactly this. Usually you give the student the problem to struggle with before you can help them. Now, exactly the best ways to give students problems that they can work and engage with is you can do this in different ways. But I'm just gonna give you an example of some use of some technology, these interactive simulations that can actually be quite useful for this. And so this would be teaching students very basic ideas of electricity. And so you would give the students first this, the task that this simulation, you've got batteries and light bulbs and wires, you figure out what's needed to make a light bulb light. And this is one of the FET simulations, and you see you've got different components here, and you can the student can use them to hook up different things and see what happens. Now, student in, at the beginning level, students aren't going to be nearly as fluent, and and they're going to try all sorts of different things before they can figure out. Maybe they'll success, succeed in eventually figuring out how to make it light up. Maybe they won't, but they'll at least learn a lot. And then after they've engaged in trying to figure this out, then you give them, you know, Ohm's law and the basic guide laws of electricity. They're prepared to learn from that and it's much more effective. Here, here's another example I've used a lot in teaching introductory quantum mechanics uh, with the photoelectric effect simulation. And the students are just given the task of figure out the conditions for light to emit electrons from metal. And they work on that for a while and, and then you go into the, after they've explored it, then they're told about the, the photoelectric effect and what we know about it and so on. So the, the reason this problem first is so much more effective at teaching uh, is first it focuses the students in trying to figure things out, it draws their attention on what are the key features they need to be thinking about to solve this problem? And that results in that when they are given knowledge, information, they organize it much better for later applications. And so for transfer to making further problem solving decisions, it's just much more effective. And then it also motivates learning because they, they have some reason, they have you know, this problem to solve, they see the inform that they're getting this information is it, why it's useful for it. Okay, so then the other aspect that's important in teaching this is to have problems that you're giving the students to solve, not just have a simple numerical answer, but really make the solutions require them to actually make and justify decisions as part of their solution process, as, a, as an explicit part of their uh, process. And as I say, you'll want to choose a subset of decisions that, to match the particular course and so on, but some that we see that apply and we and been useful to teach students, even at the most introductory level, it, quite uh, effective is, you know, what what concepts apply to this problem? How to plan solution? Is the answer reasonable? And then finally, in teaching this, you have to have good feedback. And the aspects of good feedback are that it's timely, specific, and actionable. And 
By actionable, I mean it really tells the students what they need to do to improve and gives them a chance to actually put that into, put those ideas into action later on. So all of those things are sort of in the individual parts of what goes into the, the what you, if you like, the cognitive processes of the individual for learning problem solving. But then there's another aspect I want to introduce of social learning, which is also just research that shows quite effective at helping students learn this. Uh, and this goes back to the fact that I think many of you will have said or heard from others how, gee, I learned that I understand this so much better after I've actually taught it. And I see lots of people nodding heads here. And it turns out this is actually quite an extensively studied idea in cognitive psychology. And it, what's behind it, it, they've shown, is that there's really a different kind of cognitive processing that, that, that the brain uses when it's being called upon to explain something to somebody else or teach something to somebody else. It's, it's kind of the brain has these special social circuitry and that the mere fact of, of trying to teach something to, to another person actually enhances the learning and, or understanding of a person beyond what they get just from thinking about it. And so what research has shown is that the most effective way to have the students learn is working in small groups uh, on trying to make these decisions and solve problems and the groups are teaching and critiquing each other uh, and giving each other feedback to help make that learning work. I, I do want to say though that we get lots of examples from students and lots of complaints from students about, about group work that doesn't work very well, that there are a bunch of details you have to get right to really structure the the groups and the activity to make this a valuable learning experience. And part of that is to make sure there is some individual work too. It's not all groups. Okay, so I'm just gonna move on. Those are sort of things you need to do right. I'm gonna go through some very common mistakes that people make that hurt the effective teaching of problem solving. And this is really almost all in the different categories of removing the decisions, removing the opportunity to practice making problem solving decisions. And uh, for example, you know, they making these problems very artificial and they have very little context and don't have fewer decisions than any real world problem. Having problems where, and this, this is very, very common, all the information they need to solve the problem is given and only the information needed to solve the problem is given. Now, in solving real problems, one of the big challenging decisions is recognizing what information you need and how to get it. And so that's being taken away. Again, telling, telling them that the assumptions to make, you know, the pulleys massless and frictionless and so on to, to simplify it again these deciding what assumptions are reasonable and how to justify them is a key aspect of good problem solving. Having problems always decomposed into parts and so the student never has to make the decisions of how to actually decompose a problem properly. And then as I said before, not, not requiring the solutions that students are providing to, to actually show the the decisions they make and justify them. And in a research setting, what often can happen that's bad is the student comes in with some problem and the advisor wants to get the research moving as fast as possible and so they tell them, oh, here, here's what you should do and never having the student practice having to think about what might be the best way to do it. And, you know, the, it might make the research move faster in the short term, but it provides much worse, less training for students. And then inadequate feedback to guide people to think better, to make better decisions. It, and, the, and that usually comes in the form of it's too delayed or, or not specific enough to be useful. 
Okay, so I'm gonna just wrap up with, I've given you lots of things here. I wanna just show you that if we've done some demonstrations that this kind of teaching actually does work. And so I'm gonna give you a demonstration of we two classes where I've been somewhat involved with it, introductory physics and an, then a very advanced undergraduate physics, uh, modern optics, where they, based on this deliberate practice of making decisions in a social learning environment. And so the, the first case is this large introductory uh, physics class took two sections of this with very nearly identical student populations. And then the two were taught in two different ways. The controlled section was taught by a highly experienced professor who used a standard lecture method. And then the experimental section was taught by someone who was a fairly new PhD, but trained in these principles uh, that I just told you about. So they agreed to cover the same amount of material in the same time and then give the students a surprise quiz at the afterwards on, to see what they'd learned from these classes. So the experimental class, the lecture class, I assume you know how it was. The experimental class had a short pre-class assignment. They did just gave them basic information. And then it would have a set of questions they'd have to solve like this one that with you've got a light bulbs and a battery and we have to predict what's going to happen to the to bulb two when you close the switch and then every student it's a you know it's a 270 student class so every student had a what's called a clicker or nowadays just use a cell phone and they have to answer and so, you know, and then it's recorded. The instructor's computer records who they were and what what answers they chose, and they can see that for the whole class. And then the students aren't told the answer. Instead, they're they're told to discuss it with their neighbors, and as to what the answers, which is right and why, and then revote. And while they're doing that, the instructor is circulating around, listening in on those conversations, getting little snapshots of what's going on in the students' brains, what's, what thinking is right and what's not. And then they demonstrate, show the result, and then have a follow-up feedback session by the instructor that would go over which models and reasoning of the students were correct and which were incorrect and why. And this is based on their con what they hear from the student conversations and also looking at the student voting. And for, it didn't all just work with multiple choice questions. For some of this was more mathematical topics. And so there they'd have worksheets where they'd have to write it out, but still much the same process of talking to each other as they were doing it. So just to emphasize how this is, effective, it's really having students practicing the thinking you want them to learn. They're practicing thinking like physicists. They're having to decide on what con the conceptual model for electricity, decide how it would uh, work in this particular situation, and they're having to critique their reasoning of themselves and their fellow students in the discussions. And while they're doing that, they're getting feedback from multiple sources on how to improve their thinking. They're getting it from other students, they're getting it from comparing their prediction with what actually happens, and they're getting it from the informed instructor. So this was an experiment comparing the two different ways of teaching. And so here's the results of the test that, that compared them with the, this test score here and the histogram of students there. And you can see both the learning from the lecture is really small because random guessing on this gave, would give three. But also, and more important, the, you can see that in the experimental class, the entire distribution moved up. So it really shows that this is more effective learning for all the students, not just the best or the worst ones. Okay, in the second, uh, demonstration is is a much more advanced course 
and done in a different way. Here the instructor had taught this course for a few years and uh, using a standard lecture format. But then he converted his lectures into worksheets where the student, he focused on what decisions were actually having to be made in, in, the, in the solutions to problems and the presentation. And the students had to work those, figure those decisions out then on the worksheets working in, in small groups. And this is just a quick example of when the typical problem, the, given a laser with an interferometer cavity here and the, there's the textbook has the, the amplitude written out and they first have to explain the term, uh, meaning of one of the terms there, but then they have to decide how you would, how you would, the expressions would change to include losses in the cavity. Now, the basic structure of this the way this course is run is one that we've seen work in really all levels of classes from introductory physics up to graduate quantum field theory um, and different class sizes. And it's the students do a little bit of preparation ahead of time, basic factual material that then the instructor introduces the topic and then the the students work in their small groups completing these worksheet activities and they're monitored by the instructor as they're doing that. And then about every 10 or 15 minutes as they get to different parts of the, complete different parts of the activity, then the instructor will pull the class together and then give them feedback on, on what they've done, answering questions, bringing everybody up to a similar level. And then the students iterate back and continue working through the through the activity for the remainder of class time. And the, the two essential features in this that are, that are critical here, again, the principles I'm talking about, the students are practicing the thinking, the decision making and reasoning that you want them to learn. And the instructor is providing timely and specific feedback on how they can do it better. And just the results from this, uh, of course, I'm going to, you know, it's an ex we're doing research here. And so had a set of particularly authentic and challenging problems from this course that he used on the midterm and gave it multiple years here. And, and basically, when the course was switched from a lecture to this deliberate practice instruction, it improved by a full standard deviation in the student uh, answer. Okay, so I'll just finish here and we have hopefully some time for questions. Uh, the, uh, just, the conclusion here is that I'd like you to take away is that problem solving is really an essential skill of being a good physicist. And you, you can learn that by this deliberate practice of problem solving decisions and that this process really develops new capabilities in the brain. And there's some good references here if you want to learn more about this. So thank you. Well, thank you for the very, very nice lecture, very useful lecture, um, illuminating. Um, we are open for questions. Kianru. So is there a microphone there? You can, you can use the microphone. So uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I, I have a question. So you mentioned like at the beginning, uh, like b basically before uh, the lecture, there is the um, pr like reading, pre-reading. Um, so I wonder how this can, because I, I'm just thinking of like, for example, kids with like say dyslexia or um, ADHD or stuff that can cause it difficult for them to actually read in a timely manner. So I wonder how can this be, I guess, um, how can we, or is there any way to incorporate like some yeah. techniques or whatever for, yeah. for those kids? Yeah, so I mean the advanced preparation you really can't expect students to learn very much from. I mean that's, that's essentially what class is from. But you mm -hmm. can, 
it's good for just transmitting basic facts or phenomena that you want them to, to discuss. Mm -hmm. And your point about, so you want to have quite targeted reading, but in fact, I've just been reading a, a research article where they found that their students weren't benefiting very much from this, but they also realized their students didn't have very good reading skills. And yes. so they made, the instructor then made short videos and, and that essentially said the same thing and found that for these, these students that worked much better than actually giving them reading to do as they were given short instructional videos that covered essentially the same material. Oh, so that's, that's that would, I'd say, would be one way that's been shown to be a, an alternative. I see, that's useful, thank you. Okay, please go ahead. Um, is there maybe some insight that you might have on how these teaching techniques may scale to uh, very large introduction classes or maybe scenarios where there are significant uh, portions of the students who maybe don't really care about learning that much? I think it's easy to imagine um, uh, maybe a class where there's a large proportion of, say, pre-med students who are only taking the class because their major requires it. Right. So. So this brings in a whole different issue, which I, is important, but I didn't talk about, and that's student motivation. And there are, are things, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, it's a challenge, and different students look at it different ways, but there are a few different things we know that are important for motivating students. And the most important is probably finding some meaningful context uh, to, to present the material in. And that, you know, that goes back somewhat to my choice of problems, you know, the sort of real world problems as opposed to these artificial physics book problems that people can see why there's some value and some use. And obviously the better you can, the things that, that connect best to the student's own lived experiences are most motivating in that case. So that's, that's one aspect of motivation that's, in, that, that's helpful and useful. A couple of others is the scene of giving students some degree of autonomy over the learning experience and some level of choice it's got, you know, in a big class, introductory class, it's limited, but you can give them some and every little bit helps. And then finally, giving students the sense that they can master the material and how to master the material. And the how to master the material is kind of a lot of what I'm talking about here, of this much more explicit seeing how to break the problem down into decisions to follow and so on. Uh, that mo is much more motivating to people if they, if they see, yes, they can be successful at doing this. I see. Thank you. Hi. Um, so regarding these 29 sort of principles or steps in the problem-solving process, decisions to be made, yeah. um, most of them seem like pretty true and kind of resonate, but at the same level, I'm curious, what's the methodology that brings like these 29 out? Would you, how would you know it's not 28, not 30? How do you sort of show that these are the orthogonal and complete set of? Yeah, so, so what we did was we took, I mean, you know, that is the research, and, and I, in fact, the, the lowest, the bottom here is a paper that talks about this. But we took this very large number, so actually almost 50 of, these people and we had them go through in detail their process of solving some authentic problem in their, in their field that they had done. And, and then we looked and analyzed that in terms of what, what actions they took and that ref, reflected and choices they had to make. And so you know, sometimes they they explicitly say, well, they had to decide among these options or make this decision. Other times we'd just be able to see from the, the research progress steps that they were making certain choices in that. And so we'd have a whole bunch of these different interviews with the process and we'd go through and we'd analyze 
you know, okay, so what decisions were being made in each of these? And this is what we came out with, basically. Uh, and we found that these 29, you know, some of, some, they wouldn't all use all 29, but a very large fraction, that all of them used a very large fraction, and a large fraction of them did use all 29 as well. Now, some, some of them, it does get a little messy in that sometimes, and, and this is somewhat field dependent, but some of these decisions would be sort of combined uh, in that, and if you look at that, you can sort of see how sometimes it be, might be hard to untangle whether this is, you know, this decision or that decision or some of both. And so we, that's, that's just a, in some sense, that's just one of the limitations of it. Thank you. That, that was the, that, that's the way to do it of just analyzing, you know, many, many people solving problems and going, over in detail their, the steps they took in their research and all the choices they made that we ended up. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. So uh, my question is about, uh, you mentioned you have two groups of students and with different kind of teaching methods and even eventually you test them. So I'm curious about the test. Like I would imagine that there might be some kind of Mm, way to uh, design those exam questions or even rubrics so that you can re really reflect on like how much the student really understand the subject. So could you please tell us more about the test itself? Uh, yeah, so if you're referring to the, if you're referring to the one with the introductory physics class, uh, so yeah, I mean, th that was the two instructors sort of jointly made up the ex exam, so it wasn't sort of favored for one or the other. And it was a lot of the questions used were actually taken from previous courses uh, and were kind of uh, clicker questions or test questions that they had they'd used and they they agreed the but that both instructors had agreed on the on the particular set of learning objectives to cover, and so once you have a detailed learning objective, it's pretty straightforward to have a test question that really probes that particular objective, and so that's the way they were developed. Uh, and so they they probably were, you could say, they were aligned more carefully with the material covered than in many classes which don't have such detailed objectives that they're going to teach to. Hi, thanks for the talk. And um, this, is, this seems really, like really cool work. <clears throat> what I'm wondering is, you've shown how this works in uh, like a college setting. And um, I'm curious, you know, a lot of people who might be interested in physics uh, might end up feeling discouraged from pursuing a career in physics before they reach the college classroom. Um, and I'm wondering if you've, uh, like if you have some thought about how this might be adaptable to like a high school setting or earlier and what that, what that might look like. Yeah, so I mean, first I have to be very careful because I don't have any research on this. And so I'm just now extrapolating, whereas almost everything else I've talked about here, we've got research behind it. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that uh, at almost all of it, or, or m not almost, all of it, period, would apply to the high school setting. I think that, you know, what they're trying to teach and how and, and the principles are, are general enough that they, they would apply to the high school. Once you get below high school, the, the educational challenges and complications and uh, just get messier. And so I, I think it's likely they would apply, but there could be other factors that come in that are much more important in, in the actual learning. That So I would be hesitant to be too general there. Thank you. OK. So we have three more questions, and then uh, yeah, please go. 
Thank you very much for the excellent talk and also for the FET application that I use and like very much. Uh, and my question, I don't know, maybe I'm challenging your assumption at the beginning, you say the students come with all the brains equal, regardless of their potential, we do find the students with a very, very broad range of capabilities. Uh, and there are students who uh, metaphorically can do a hundred push-up and others that need to build up their muscles, for example, in basic algebra. So is it, uh, based on your research, best to just disregard that and randomize the groups, or should we, uh, we would be more effectful in making placement and sections based on their capabilities? Yeah. So, so I, I would take issue probably with your statement that they have different capabilities. Uh, we've, we've actually been studying this a fair amount, and I, I would argue they, they have big differences, but what we've been able to identify is that the performance in introductory physics is very, very dependent on their incoming preparation, and we can trace that back to who had a lousy physics teacher or who had a good physics teacher in high school and whether they went to a rich school or a poor school. And so, so I'm much more inclined to, th to think that it's kind of more a matter of, of privilege and preparation than it is capabilities. But nevertheless, you're right that they have very different preparation, which means they're ready to do quite different things. And this is, this is, uh, certainly always a big challenge in teaching that you have students which, which are at very different levels. Now, one of the things that we've done actually is we developed an introductory physics course because we had data showing that at Stanford the, that we could measure their incoming preparation and, and quite accurately predict what grade they were going to get in introductory physics based on just this, this brief test we gave them before the course started. And so we developed a course that was much more along the lines of what I talked here, where we gave them much more realistic, real-world problems, and we had this much, much more explicit focus on problem sol on learning these problem-solving practices, decisions, and we, f we found that that showed then their performance was much less correlated with their previous preparation, uh, probably just because they're learning quite different things than what they get in high school, whereas the regular physics course, there's an awful lot of overlap between what they're learning in high school. So, so that was just, that more a statement also of justifying that, that even if they have weaker preparation, if they're given good instruction, they can thrive. Uh, but, but I don't mean to, to dismiss the, the, the challenges of having very different preparation in class. And you mentioned just like, how do you divide this up for groups? What's the most effective? And there's different opinions on that. My own, that based on a fair amount of evidence, is that it's probably better to have groups of, uh, in, in the kind of physics class type setting, it's best to have groups of, of, of comparable preparation and background because they, they, have a more likely will be working out the problem together that way as opposed to somebody knowing the answer and just giving it to the students who are lost and not participating. But. Well, thank you so much. Great. Hi, uh, I taught my first physics course in the fall and I noticed that there was maybe one or two students who I don't think they did as well as they could have done because of a lack of self-confidence. How do I go about instilling that in in students? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's an important aspect in all of this, and partly what you can do is, is give them 
problems they can be successful in and give him a, a, a structure, you know, and, and so that's what I think we do with these very under, poorly prepared students of why we've helped made them more successful is we give them this problem solving structure to follow and they, they can feel that they accomplished it better. And so, you know, that's one thing, but th there's another aspect of this that's, that's important and it, it's just, I'm not sure in your class, maybe you didn't do this, but I see in a lot of physics courses, the, the exams are really being developed much more to sort the students than they are to, and so what ha that means is, you know, an ideal exam to sort the students means you have the average score is like 50% and you have a standard deviation of 25%, et cetera. But what that, it, people don't appreciate that to the student, they go and study really hard and they get 50% and it's not really, they don't take the lesson of, gee, I'm at the class average. They take the lesson that I studied really hard and I only learned half of what I was expected to learn. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think it's very important to have very clear learning objectives that you have and you have your, your tests really cover those learning objectives. And it might be that students can do well on a bunch of them because everybody can learn them, but that's, that's sort of a reasonable trade-off uh, and it helps them feel like, yes, they really were mastering it. Thanks very much. Um, for the last three years, I'm trying to teach optics, as you are saying. So I'm lecturing, maybe a little bit in a traditional way, maybe with some demonstrations. And then there is a class solving problem. Uh, I split the students in groups and they are solving the problems and they're presenting them. And I struggle with this because there are so many different problems on different aspects. So let me bring maybe three uh, problems that I'm facing and maybe I would like to hear your comment on this one. The first one, there are students who don't want to work with other students. They, are, they, they, they really want to be, so, so shall I leave them alone? I guess I do, but that's the first one. The second one is that better students, for the sake of an argument, tend to work, tend to group with better students. So we have groups that naturally evolve. And then third, and this is also a comment from the student, that we are doing it slower. So particularly uh, when I'm teaching, you know, interferometry, I want to talk about Fabry-Perot interferometer or diffraction. Uh, I cannot cover whole material this way, right? Because this is taking more time and this is taking more things. So the question would be, shall I give up on some of the material and say they will do this in the future? Or should I, for example, assign homeworks associated with the thing? So... so Okay, so let me, let me answer at least two of those questions. The, the coverage of the material is one that we've looked at quite a lot. And, we, and you do have to think carefully about how to optimize coverage of, the, of material. I mean, you know, obviously you can give a lecture and you can cover infinite amounts of material, you know. You can go through 200 view graphs in a, in a class and they don't learn anything at all, so you, you, you do want to worry about that. But what we found is that for people who are careful about this, like the example I gave you of the, of the modern optics course, they, if, if you work, think about carefully how to optimize the coverage of material, and that may mean that some things you don't cover in class, but you just have them do as homework, but because they've gains the skills in class, they have the capabilities to, to cover the material on their own. And so that's one thing. So, yeah, so with, with careful planning, we, we find that generally there's very, it's almost as much material. Sometimes there's a little bit less, but it, it's not very much less. The, the other question about the students not wanting to work in groups, um, so this is one thing that is quite important is, is just, especially if students haven't had the experience of being taught this way, it's important to kind of 
get the, them as buy-in. And so uh, it makes a big difference to spend some time on the first day explaining exactly why you're teaching this way and how it's being done for their benefit. They're not just guinea pigs in your, your exper experiment on them. And so, so you know, the, the, the reasons for how and why it's it's useful for them is important, and and also how to how to interact in groups uh, effectively, and that goes a long ways. There there are still a few students who sort of want to just not work in there, and then I look at this as as well. You know, that's just not something we should be giving them an alternative on because we know that any any person, you know, student going on to a reasonable career, they're going to need to interact with people and they're going to need to learn how to work with other people. And I figure this is kind of like just having a, a required course, you know, it's a required activity that that's, they may not realize that how important it is for them to learn, but we do and we, it's just something we should overrule their judgment on. Thank you. Okay, great. So we are running late. So a very, very quick question, very fast. Uh, I don't have a quick question, so. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe let's let's come in. But there could be more questions after, but I mean, I think we are already ten minutes late. So let's thanks speaker. Great. I see you all tomorrow.